We are in the, the third part of a four-part series. This is our vision series, our mission statement series. This is us. This is who we are. This is what we believe. This is what we, we make our claim on. All things new. We're going to read our core verses in just a minute, but we're taking our mission statement of love, live, lead. We're breaking it down into three sermons and, and preaching those. And today we are on love, love like no other. No, I'm sorry. That was last week. I was just seeing if you're paying attention. We're on live, live with intention. I got notes. I'll get to those in a minute. Yeah, that's why we write notes. Live with intention. Love like no other was last week, and that's what equips us to do what we're going to talk about this week, living with intention. Amen. So let's go ahead and put those verses up on the screen. Let's read those together. We're going to start with Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. This is the ESV version. It says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Go ahead and read it out loud. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Amen. And our mission statement here, you want to put that up on the screen. It says, we will be the church where people encounter the love of God, where they learn to live out God's purpose and plan for their life so they can lead others to him. Come on, love, live, lead. We will love like no other. Live with intention and lead by example. Come on, because we believe he makes. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word today, God. Lord, we thank you for what you've already done in the worship time, God. But I pray right now, God, you would go forth and go into every home, God. Every person watching online, every car, every exercise room, every whatever is going on where they're listening to the sermon. And into every heart right now in this room, God. Lord, and into our homes, God. And do what only you can do, God. Make all things new. Every situation, every circumstance. God, the past, the present, the future, God. We place it all in your hands, God. God, Lord, we ask you to do what only you can do. Speak in your voice that every ear can hear. God, I've got a message and a sermon, God. Lord, but I pray you win. God, you deliver your word today. Lord, we thank you for it. From the Sunday school room to the sanctuary, write your word on every heart. In Jesus' name, come on. The church said, amen. You are dismissed for the kids. Grade 6 and under. Go to NB Kids Ministry. God be with you, teachers. Thank you for your volunteering, your service. Nursery workers, amen. Well, happy spring, everybody. Amen. I put shovels away. I don't care if it snows. I'm not even going to shovel. We are, it's going to be all right. We're going to take that plow off that truck this week. It's spring. It's going to happen. And uh, somebody said, we've had snow on Easter. Shut your mouth. And uh, amen. So. We're not having an early morning sunrise service. We will be here at 10 on, on Easter. We've got some special things planned. Prepare, invite somebody. And uh, my parents will be speaking too and, and just sharing on some of their favorite parts of the Easter sermon series, the Easter message. We're excited what God is doing. Well, like I said, we are in the third session of our All Things New series, our foundation series. And uh, we say this, all things need, new, it needs to be in the songs we sing, the sermons we preach, and most importantly, the lives we live. Amen? The lives we live. Today we're talking about living with intention. Living with intention. So I'm going to do uh, a quick review, but we, we say that, that we desire in this church, this is our prayer, this is our, our heart's cry, that when people come in contact with us, when they walk in the doors of this church, we want them to hear that message, to, to hear it spoken, hear it sung, see it displayed, but we want them to, to feel that, to feel that he makes all things. So somebody said that people don't remember what you say, but they remember the way that you made them feel. We need to give people hope. We, we need to give people a reason for living, a reason for coming to God, and that he makes all things know there's no, nothing too far, too difficult, too big that our God can't handle. And when people come in contact with you, the church, the message they hear, hear, see, and feel is he makes all things new. So we're going to do a quick review. I really struggle sometimes with doing reviews, but um, just a quick review. Just wrote down a couple notes. From week one was the All Things New series intro. We read in Revelations 21.5, one of my favorite verses, God said, Behold, I make all things new. 
Behold. This is from the throne of God up in heaven. This is the throne. He stands up and says, Behold. It means gaze upon. Look at me. Watch this. He says, I make all things new. It's that mic drop moment up in heaven. And then it says, These words are faithful and true. Write these words down. This is what God is. This is what he does. We looked at the simplicity and power of one of our core scriptures of 2 Corinthians 5.17. I love it when things are simple. Man, I was not a scholar in school. My wife was the brainiac, and the kids take after her, thank God. But I have to work, work, work to read a book, man. It is, God is doing something new in me in over the past years that I could start to read books. I used to hate reading books, man. Give me a, give me a movie any day. And finally, my grandpa got me on a Western book, and I, I read that thing almost cover to cover. And then I started reading another one, and I realized they were all like the same story. The guy always rides off in the sunset with the girl and whatever. But, um, and then somebody turned me on to audio books. Thank you, Jesus, whoever came up with audio books. I mean, I can listen to that in a car. I'm reading a book while I'm driving. Unlike some people, we actually see reading a book while they drive or texting while they drive. I can listen to an audio book and be at work. And, and uh, so I love that, just consuming uh, this, this information and stuff these ways. But the simplicity of it, we make things too difficult. The church does not need to make it harder to get to heaven. All right? The devil's done a good enough job of that. All right? It's hard enough. We do not need to add to it. The simplicity of the gospel. It's not easy, but it's simple. It's a big kind of revelation God's given me the last couple of years that things are simple, but not always easy. It's simple. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17. So if you don't know what to say, this, this, is, this is it. If someone wants to explain the gospel, this is what you say. Well, this is one of my church's core scriptures, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone... No matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, where they've been, what they said, what they've done. If anyone is placed in Christ, equals a new creation. It's the simplicity of the gospel. Let's not make it harder than it is. Come on, this is a foundation block of this church and our life. Come on, we encounter this, experience it, and our responsibility is to tell others it. Welcome, Sister Cindy. I didn't see you earlier. Let's give Sister Cindy a round of applause. We love her. So good to see you. Amen. And again, I just wrote my notes. Well, I can't witness. I don't know what to say. You can start right here. You can say this. If anyone, you're telling you their story. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He will make you new. Come on. And before he's even finished, people aren't even going to recognize you. Before he's even finished with you, people aren't going to recognize you. Before he's even finished, he can do something so new and say, you used to what? Let me hit on some of my parents. You used to be a barmaid. People talked to my mom. Some of you are like, what? I didn't know. I can't believe that. What? My dad full of anger. What? Didn't want to be around his own kids. What? God turned him into a man that wanted to father other people's kids. Turned him into foster parents. Had over 75 kids come through their home. Foreign exchange students. People lived in our house all the time growing up. <laughs> Needed a place to stay. They opened their home. Took a broken home and made it a home so sure that they opened the doors to everybody. God can do something new. You used to what? You used to this? You used to that? That's what God can do. Able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask, think, or imagine. We love that verse in this house. Second session, we talked about love like no other. So we learned that the first thing we experience when we come to God is a love that's like no other. Not his judgment, not his list of do's and don'ts, just his overwhelming, unexpected, undeserving, unending love. And that his love is greater than any love we have ever experienced. We read in 1 Corinthians 13 what love is and what love does. Wow. That's a wow chapter in the Bible. We learn that after everything is over and done, all that remains, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, the Bible says, is love. That's why we put so much importance on it. Love is the most important. This is a quote from uh, Pastor Richard Hilton. It says, for love inspires hope and hope feeds faith. 
So we don't have a faith problem, we've got a love problem. If it starts with love, love inspires hope and hope feeds faith. See, the faith doesn't have the problem. Hope doesn't have the problem. Where we got the problem is the love, the connection. We've got the love from God, but we've got to pass that love on to others. And man, that inspires our hope. And all of a sudden, it feeds our faith. He said, the church doesn't have a faith problem or a hope problem. they got a love problem. Jesus said, they'll know you. They'll know you are of me because of your love, the way you love others. We need to fill our heart and life with love of God, and hope will rise and your faith will increase. We read in Matthew 5 what Jesus said what his love should look like in our everyday life. And now that we've experienced his love, he tells us to go and do likewise. Simple, but not easy. Go and do likewise. Love others as I have loved you. One of my favorite quotes from Billy Graham, he said this, it's God's job to judge, the Holy Spirit's job to convict, and my job to love. Say that again. It's God's job to judge, the Holy Spirit's job to convict, and my job to love. It seemed to work pretty good for him. <laughs> this philosophy, he had, he had a little ministry, kind of went worldwide. <laughs> the love of God. That is like no other. All right, session three. Somebody say new content. All right, live with intention. Live with intention. You see it when you walk in the the foyer. Love, live, lead. We are on live with intention. We're going to go through some scriptures here. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, you can leave that up on the screen. I'm gonna, we're going to have a test right now. You can use the answers are right there. Open book test. How many like open book tests? Amen. We've got a little time limit. We've got to be out of here by so long. So try to look at that screen. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Who lives? Christ. All right. It is no longer I who live. The first sentence says there, but Christ lives in me. All right, I just gave you an answer. Where does he live? Oh, man, I'm too good of a teacher. How do I live? By faith. Faith in who? The Son of God. And why do I do this? And he gave himself for me. Again, who lives? Jesus lives. Where does he live? He lives in me. Everybody say in me not just some far off place over the blue yonder or on the other side of the sunrise or sunset. Jesus lives in me. I love it. It says he loves me. We said a few weeks ago in a sermon, we were talking about uh, this man who, I can't remember his name right now, but the man who dedicated his life as a Bible scholar and, and just studied and wrote tons of books and documentaries and, and uh, just foundation series and principles on the Bible. And, and one of the times when he was doing a teaching and had a question and answer time, somebody asked him, what is the greatest revelation that you've ever had or shared or spoke? Just the, this is the greatest thing in all your years of study of revelations and, and everything that you've studied in the Bible and learned. And he paused for a moment. He said, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Oh, and those simple foundational principles change your life forever if we really receive them, believe them, and apply them, and let it pass through us and tell others. Jesus loves me. John 10.10, 10, very famous scripture, most of you know it, says the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Come on, this is red letter edition if you've got that kind of Bible. And Jesus speaking says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. What did Jesus come to do? Give us life and life more abundant. Yes, this life he gives us is eternal. But it doesn't begin when we take our last breath here on earth. It begins when we take our first breath, when we accept Jesus as Lord. Right here, right now. Brother Ron says in the nasty now and now. Right here, right now, life abundant, life eternal. I thank God for the promise of eternity in heaven. But he said, pray thy kingdom come. <laughs> His disciples said the kingdom of God is at hand. Doesn't sound like someday far off. 
but now is. Well, we got the now kind of faith. The now is. He's alive in us now, speaking, breathing. When it begins when we accept him as Savior, when we are born again. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. It says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Somebody say newness. See, there is a walk we are to walk. There are things we are to do. The word walk in that verse means to tread all around, to walk at large. It says in parentheses here, especially as proof of ability to follow and be occupied with. <laughs> to be occupied with Jesus in me. He lives in me. We are occupied. No vacancy out in front of our sign. No room. My mom always raised me with the verse, give no place to the devil. Somebody said, you give him a toehold to take a foothold. You give him a foothold to get a stronghold. Come on. We had a, at a youth group long time ago, we had shirts made. It said, sold out for Jesus. If you ever want to go to a concert back in the day when you could assemble in crowds, and it would be signed outside to be sold out. You'd be all bummed. You couldn't get in. So you'd listen from outside the door. Well, that's what the enemy has to do in our life when we sell out to Jesus. All you can do is stand in a parking lot and watch. Come on, we are sold out for Jesus. No vacancy, no room. Come on, we walk in newness of life. Another part of that word means to trample, to tread underfoot. There are some things we need to put behind us and some things we need to put underneath us. To trample on, as in victory. Amen? To put behind us, to put beneath us. And this verse ends with, we should walk in newness of life. It's not that this life is new. It's not that when we accept them, everything around us becomes Skittles, unicorns, and rainbows. And we're walking on clouds. Come on, it's not that everything else is new, but it's that everything inside is new. <laughs> we bring the newness. He brings the newness to us. And every situation we walk into, we can see with newness of life. Somebody said a while ago, so the hell surrounding you is no match for the heaven within you. I love that. We walk in newness of life. Newness of life. Everything's the same on the outside, but inside everything's different. I'm changed. I'm new. Somebody say, I'm changed. I'm new. Come on. And I will live with intention. Amen. Not in our own strength, but in his strength. Come on. Amen. This sermon, we started the series in 2018, and uh, when God was really just kind of laying this out for our vision, our mission statement, and and we started this then, and I really want to preach this every year, but this sermon, this time, is completely different than last time. Last time was more of a how-to, but now we are just noted, I really want to impress on you the why behind it, the why behind the what. Because sometimes we do the what so much, we forget the why. And it's not about doing the what, it's about the why that we want to see. It's about the vision he makes all things new. That is what we want to keep in the forefront. We want to keep behind us, pushing us forward in our forefront to see it happen. That we want to see God make all things new. And we're not going to get caught up in the how, the, what we're doing, but the why. The why. It's never about what we're doing. Yes, we are to do certain things, but it's not about that. We're going to get into that a little bit and get ahead of myself, but... I'm so thankful in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him, I like some versions say the same Spirit, but if the same Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. King James Version, if you've got that in front of you, it says to quicken your mortal bodies. I like that word, quicken. It means to make alive, to make alive. And I love that it stresses your mortal bodies. This isn't talking about in eternity, God's going to make everything right and make you new. Right now, this mortal body, God is going to quicken it. Somebody say quicken it. Amen. Right now, right here, God brings newness of life into us. Ephesians chapter 2 we're going to read a little bit from verse 1 through 10. So if you got your Bible, it's a good time to get out your Bible or 
Don't want to just watch it on the giant Bible up on a screen. But Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read verse 1 through 10. Reading verse 1, it says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." But God, somebody say, but God, God. amen, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Amen. This is written to us, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Reading on verse five, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, of his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Somebody say the gift of God. Not of works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I really wanted just to get to that last scripture, but the scriptures leading up to it are so good. This is written to us. This is our life. This is our testimony. This is our devotion. This is our encouragement. This is our mission. This is our assignment. This is encouraging to us today. Let's read verse 10 one more time. It says, for we are his workmanship. Somebody say workmanship. Created in Christ. Say in Christ. Come on, we're his workmanship. We are placed in Christ for good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk. There's that word again, walk in them. He thought of you. Workmanship. He thought of you. Everything we build in a shop or an artist starts with a thought. He thought of you. Then he designed you. And then he formed you. Pick the time in the, in the great timeline of eternity for you to be born, the family be placed in. He thought of you. You are his workmanship. He is proud of you. I love that in, when Jesus was baptized, you know, the, the voice appears that this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus ain't done nothing yet. He didn't die for your sins. I think if I was his dad, I'd be waiting until you do your whole assignment. Raised from the dead, do everything I've asked, and I'd say, I'm proud of you. But that's not the example of the father. This is my son in whom I am well pleased before he did anything, before he healed, before he raised, before he delivered, before he spoke his many teachings and and did all this great stuff, multiplied the fish and the bread and walked on water, all those things, the father said, I am proud of you. This is my son. Come on, dads, we need to take a lesson from the father. I start, my kids, when they start going to sports, before before we left the car, when we were dropping them off in school, sometimes the, the night before the tournament or whatever, say, I'm already proud of you. There's nothing you're going to do on that field or on that mat that's going to make me more proud of you. You're my son. I love you. You don't have to go out there and earn my, my, my pride or my praise. You're already loved by the Father. Go do what you love to do, man. I'm rooting for you. Come on, that's the love of the Father. That's a love like like no other that needs to flow through us, and it changes everything around us. When we apply the love into our living, it changes everything. Amen. He's crafted you, placed you with placed within you his spirit that will equip you to live for him. That's what we're talking about. Applying the love to our live. 
equip you to live for him and do all he's called you to do for his glory, to live with intention. Somebody say live with intention. The words intention and purpose are very similar. They're both used in each other's definitions if you look up each word. I like to do little word studies, and sometimes I hate it when they use the word you're trying to define as the definition. It's like, thanks for the help. That was genius. Glad you wrote a dictionary. <laughs> and sometimes that's all they put is the, like the word after it. So you look at other words that are similar to it and their definitions to really get a, a big picture. And again, this is God making all things new in me because, I, like I said, I flunked English in ninth grade. Didn't run anything to do it. And here I'm doing word studies and reading and searching. God can make all things new. Amen. Yeah, it'd be tough having a pastor who didn't read and didn't like to define stuff too. Huh? That'd be a little hard. Awkward. I said after when Pastor Paris was preaching, man, he's very educated and uh, sharing all these great words as he spoke. And I'm like, man, they're not going to get any of those $5 vocabulary words from me. So appreciate it when you get it. Expand our vocabulary. One of the things we need to do. The words intention and purpose are very similar. I think of intention as the heart of the matter. The intention behind it. What is your intention with how you live your life? What are your intentions are doing this thing? What is the heart of the matter? Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's that word, intents of the heart. To live with intention is not just to live one's life with disciplines in place to bring about an expected outcome. Come on, but it's the motivation and driving force at the very heart of our life to cause us to live for him. I'm going to say that again. To live with intention is not just to live one's life with disciplines in place to bring out an expected outcome. But it is the motivation and driving force at the very heart of our life to cause us to live for him. To love like no other that we, free, we freely receive that love that's like no other. That we didn't earn, that we don't deserve, flowing in us, then out to others to live with intention. It is the love of God that impacts the way we live our lives that will in turn lead others to Christ. You see how this all works together. We can't have one without the other, but it starts with love. We'll say that line again. It is the love of God that so impacts the way we live our lives that will in turn lead others to Christ. The way we live our life. The joy that we have. That's good. good, good give God a praise break for that. Amen? Come on. You're not going to scare me if you clap or say amen. It actually kind of helps. So uh, We were at a church a while ago. Somebody shouted me down. I'm like, brother, can you just like travel with me everywhere we go? Or like clone you? Like, whoa. And uh, it's just so good. The what is the love of God. You can put this up on the screen. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. The what is the love of God. The how is the way we live. The why is to lead others to Christ. Love, live, lead. What is the love of God. How is the way we live. Why is to lead others to Christ. I was listening to a, a preacher this morning, and, and he was doing his... Vision Week series, Vision Week sermon. He gave a definition to, to vision. If you want to write it down, you can. I'm sorry I didn't have it in my notes. I just, just heard it this morning. I just stole it this morning. It says a vision is a clear mental picture of what could be fueled by the conviction that it should be. I'll say it again. Vision, a clear mental picture of what could be fueled by the conviction that it should be. Come on, our vision is that God makes all things new. And that is going to fuel us and impact the way we live our life to do things we never did before, a way we never did before, maybe things we didn't think of, or maybe that's not how the church used to do it, or, or whatever, that sounds strange, weird, or unusual. Somebody said, we'll do anything short of sinning to tell people of Jesus, to reach people for Christ. We will do anything. Will you do Something that maybe isn't the norm. Will you go? Will you be? Will you shine your light in the darkness? A pastor friend of mine texted me and said, pray for me, brother. I, I've got to be somewhere that's dark. I've got to do something that's hard. I've got to tell someone of a, 
a loved one who passed and their last conversation was horrible and they're in a horrible place. And, and he listed some of the other details of the situation that just make you go, wow. And he's like, pray for me. And I sent him a text back and I'm praying for you right now. And I said, you could be anywhere on the earth, but God puts you in this place right now with the words of life and a light that outshines any darkness. It is not by accident that you are there right now. You are on assignment. You are on mission. Go, my brother. Speak the words of life that conquer all death and speak the words, the, the light, the light of the world that shines in any darkness. Man, if God be for us, who can be against us? Love, like no other, was last week. His love is truly amazing. It chases us, it calls to us, it invites us. And we did that little demonstration. And when he knocks and Revelation talks about, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice, opens that door, he will come in. I hope you thought about that illustration. I thought about it this week. I loved it. Then he never says, Oh, I didn't know you would be doing that. I don't want to come in. Do you ever, you ever go to somebody's door at a bad time, a wrong time? Like, this is not the time to be at somebody's door. We used to do caroling at our house. We used to go door to door. Well, we quit doing that after a certain couple instances happened. Door to door. They're not coming to the door. Kids are looking in the windows. Oh, my. Don't look, kids. You know, people do actually walk around in their underwear. Who knew on Christmas Eve? You know, and things like that. It's like, all right, next house. Next house. We just want to sing for you, but would like you to be clothed. Um, so it's just things like that. But Jesus, when he knocks on the door, it doesn't matter what's going on. If you open the door, he comes in. Again, it's the simplicity of the gospel. If any man hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in. It's the simplicity of the gospel. You don't need a PhD. You don't need a master in theology, a doctorate, and all these things. It's laid out before us for us to receive, for us to live out, for us to tell others. But we cannot stop with the change that just happens to us. We cannot stop with just receiving his love. We cannot stop there. It must flow in us and through us. The love that is like no other must be permitted to change, impact, and affect the way we live. If it doesn't change how we live, then you didn't find salvation. You found something else. Somebody said, I'm, I'm coming off your porch and I'm coming into the house now. <laughs> I said, tuck your feet under your, your, your chairs when we start talking about the way we live. If the love that is like no other does not impact, severely impact, to really change direction of the way we live our life, I want to tell you, you did not find salvation. You found something else. God doesn't want to be a hobby. He wants to make you holy. <laughs> He doesn't want a one-night stand. He wasn't, doesn't want to need your boyfriend or girlfriend. Come on, he, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. To be in relationship. Not a weekend warrior. Come on, you're on active duty. Active duty. This isn't something we do on Sunday. It's what we live Monday through Saturday. I say it a thousand times. I'll keep saying it. The way we live Monday through Saturday needs to confirm that Sunday was true. Sunday shouldn't have to make up for how we live Monday through Saturday. Sunday reinforces how we live. This is the huddle time. Amen. Everybody knows I'm a coach. This is us just coming together and breaking it down and saying, all right, go break and go get them. Go do it again. Go have it. Go, go get it. This is our huddle. This isn't our everything. We said it, the, the, on our banner out there, it says, you are now entering the mission field. That's not for somebody we just send to Africa. This is for you. This is for me. On that job, in that school, on that street, at that gas station, we are all on mission and assignment. Love is the salvation. Live and lead is the assignment, the mission, and your calling. It is your ministry. I don't ever want to hear somebody talk about, oh, I wish I could be in the ministry. I wish you would be in the ministry. It's called every day, 24-7, 365, where you live, what you do. God has called you to be a mechanic, a lawyer, a doctor, a whatever, a teacher, a homeschool mom, anything. God has called you to do that for his glory and minister to those people that we will never see, that you have reached into their lives. God is using you on assignment. 
I'll say it again. Love is, love is the salvation. Live and lead is the assignment. The mission, calling, and ministry that he has called you to. If it was just about the love and the moment of salvation, then he'd bring us to heaven as soon as we accepted him. We've talked about that before. But he didn't. We're still here. You are still here. Because God has something for you to do. To occupy until he comes. Military term. Occupy. A presence. Until he comes and rescue others in it. I love the illustration, an illustration of freeze tag we used to play as kids. I don't know if kids still do that anymore. But you go around and you get frozen. And when somebody unfroze you, what was your assignment? To go and unfreeze other people. Go and unfreeze other people. When you're rescued, it's not for you just to stand up on the rock and have a picnic. It's for you to turn around and rescue others. We are all on assignment. The love of God brings salvation, healing, wholeness, deliverance, peace, etc. All to do what? Not to go back to where we came from. Not to go live the same way. To live on purpose for a purpose. To live with intention. That's what we're talking about this morning. Live can also be pronounced live. It's spelled the same way. Live live. As if we're live from Fairview, Pennsylvania. We used to watch a late show that would say that. Live from New York. When it's live, anything can happen. When it's streaming live, anything can happen. We post later on YouTube, but we're live right now on Facebook. So anything can happen live. Do you believe God is live working in you? Working in your situation and circumstance for his glory. In the moment, we are seeing the gospel played out live in our lifetime. I thank God for the awesome movies that display David and Goliath and Moses and Joshua and, and all the armies. And there's so many great stories. I wish... Uh, Warner Brothers and all the other movie places would stop remaking the same movies that the previous generation made and try to make them better and just go back and get all these awesome Bible stories. I share some of the Bible stories with people in my life and they're like, that's in the Bible? And we're like, yeah, this thing's like R-rated, man. Affairs and murders and distrust and all these different things happening, wars and heroes and people rising up in the midst of horrible situations. People believe in God and miracles happening. And they're like, that's in the Bible. Like, yeah. I love those movies that tell those stories, and they're awesome. But I thank God God is alive working today in us and through us, that we can see it played out in our lifetime. This is not a pre-recorded message. When you pray, you don't get an answering machine or service from heaven. It says, well, if it's this, I'll speak this, or this, I'll say this. When we looked at 2 Corinthians 5.17 and, and said, uh, said what it meant, but now I want to look at another core scripture, that Lamentations 3.22 and 23. In the ESV it says, you can put that back up on the screen, it says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. See, this verse shows us that there is so much more to f than finding salvation. If, if it was just about that moment, then we wouldn't need the steadfast love. That word steadfast means immovable, firmly fixed, no, not subject to change. We wouldn't need steadfast love if it was just about a moment of salvation. We wouldn't need the love of God that never ceases, the Bible says. Never ceases. Go ahead and put that verse back up for me and kind of go through this just with me. We would need mercies that never come to an end if it was just about the moment of salvation. We wouldn't need them to be new every morning, and we wouldn't need his great faithfulness. But aren't you glad it's not a one-night stand with Jesus? Come on, it's not a spring fling with Jesus. I'm so thankful, and I want to encourage you this morning that his love for you is steadfast. It never ceases. His mercy for you never comes to an end. They're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness to you and yours over your life this isn't just some cute cute verse come on this is what we build our life on this is what our church is founded on come on this sermon is so much different than what i gave in 2018 holly can come up starting to wrap it up here when i gave this series the first time i listed the things that god gives you to help you live with intention i talked about a new birth a new father a new name a new nature a new covenant a new promise of eternal home, a new peace, and a new joy. That was, it was a good sermon. You can go back to 2018, 
probably weren't posting those things at the time, but you can get the CD if anybody still has a CD player. Those things God gives to us, and that's great. There, there's many practical sermons and studies that I could give on this subject, and I encourage you to do some of those studies. You can Google how to live with intention. You'll find some great studies. Things like love God, love people, serve others, Bible study, prayer, relationship and accountability and all those things will help you but more than a how-to or seven steps to lead you to intentional living i want you to know what god is calling us to be and to do in this place and in every place that you walk every place that you live everything that you do to have and to remember the why behind the what so that our intentions are not forgotten did you ever come across somebody that's doing something and they don't even know why we did not never let that happen in our Christian walk. This is why I do it. I do it not just to do it or just to see certain results with the attention behind it is why I do it. To know him and to make him known. To be known by him. So that our intentions are not forgotten. We don't just go through the motions. So that doing good deeds, because that's what we're supposed to do. We don't just do that. But we do them for a reason, for a purpose but that our intentions push us to do, but they also stop us to be. I like that statement. Our intentions need to push us to do, but there's times where we need to stop and be, and it's not about the doing, it's about the being. It's about who and what God has called us to be and to do and the, the intentions behind it. We've found ourselves over the years doing that, Yes, we need to feed people. Yes, we need to clothe people. Yes, we need to be present in the community. But it's never about feeding. It's never about giving backpacks away. It's never about giving Christmas gifts away. It's about leading others to Jesus. And that sounds great. It sounds simple, but it is not easy. We need to be his hands and feet, his voice in our everyday life that we're never too busy. How many ever missed an opportunity to be that light? I'll raise both hands and a foot and the other foot if I could. I missed it. Somebody was telling me the other day of an opportunity they missed and they're like, they picked somebody up, their car broke down and they, they knew the guy, they knew the vehicle so they stopped and picked him up and they were, drove him into his workplace. It was on, in the morning on a weekday, so they drove him into the workplace and, and the guy said thanks for the ride, but on the way there, he started sharing how his wife has cancer and so heavy on his heart and doesn't know what to do and shared his, his open wound with the man. And this guy thought he was doing the good do, deed that God had called him to do by just giving the man a ride. He's a Christian. He's like, oh, this is a good deed. I need to do. I need to give this man a ride. But in the doing, he forgot the why. It wasn't about the car ride. I believe it wasn't the enemy that broke that man's tire or gave him a flat. God used it for his glory, for his purpose, to give this man an opportunity to share the love and the light and the hope of the gospel. But he didn't. And he was so upset later. He goes, it wasn't until I got to work because now I'm tr tr worried about me being late to work and, and get to work. And, and frankly, I was kind of proud of myself that I actually went out of my way to stop and help somebody that was in need. And, and it was a good thing he did. It was. It was a good deed. But in the doing, we have to remember to be stopped and be the B. <laughs> the intention, the why behind why we do what we do. And he was telling me, he's like, I missed it. I mean, he was so upset. And I was like, man, I've been there. I've done it, the same thing. Not that same exact circumstance or situation, but I've walked through opportunities, helped somebody, and it was a good thing. But God's like, you didn't do what I wanted you to do. Yeah, I did. I helped him. That wasn't why. I could have had anybody give him a ride. I could have had anybody fix this for him. But I need you to pray with him. I need you to share with him. I need you to be the light. A city set on a hill that can't be hid. So I encouraged him. I said, we've all been there. We've all failed. But he's such a good father and a good coach that he picks us up. And he says, now go. I'm going to give you another opportunity. Thank God there's no shame. Amen. No condemnation. We learn. 
But we use those examples to remind us next time, God, I'm going to do better. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to speak, and I'm going to shine. That we never lose the why and the how. The why is to lead others to him. The how is the way we live. It's never just about the harvest party. I wrote a few things down at our church. It's never about building gingerbread houses. It's never about giving gifts away or feeding the masses. It's never about a rummage sale. It's never about community day. It's never about a backpack giveaway. It's not about having the best sign out front, a buildings, a gymnasium, a sanctuary, lighting or sound. It's not about the worship team. It's not about the sermon or who the pastor is. It's not about the small groups we have or don't have, the classes we teach, the children's church, the nursery, the groups. It's all about Jesus and leading others to him. That is the purpose of this church and our lives, each and every one of you. That is your mission. I saw this, each and every one of us individually and then corporately being the church where people encounter the love of God and are equipped to live out God's purpose for their life so they can lead others to Him. I want that to be so much more than something we recite, but something we live. I saw this online the other day. I want to share with you this picture. It's what we've been reiterating for a few years now, well before the pandemic hit. You have that picture you want to put up? Somebody posted on in their church sign. We've been saying this for years now. God isn't calling us to go to church. He's calling us to be his church. Now catch the intentions behind it and don't get all offended because we do need to assemble. We're not going to forsake the gathering together, but that's not what this is intention tending behind it. There's so much more than going. It's about being. We need to go, we need to do, but we also need to be, to be. The caption underneath this when they post it, it says, we are not spiritual consumers, we are spiritual contributors. The church does not exist for us, but we are the church and we exist for the world. (laughs) I'm gonna say it one more time, it's a great sermon and a statement. We are not spiritual consumers, we are spiritual contributors. The church does not exist for us, But we are the church and we exist for the world. I want to say this and I want you to hear me. The day of consumer Christianity needs to end. The day of consumer Christianity needs to be over. What can I get out of this? How can my membership here benefit me? How will you meet my needs? 2020 showed us that we may not always be able to go to church. But you are always able and called to be the church 2020 showed us that we may not always be able to go to church but we are always able to be the church to be the church God is calling you and equipping you to live with intention amen amen that's the word for this morning so glad you're here and you're submitting to God's call and will on your life to live, to shine, to speak. If you would just bow your heads and hearts with me this morning. And I want to give this this call, if anyone's here in this room or joining us online and you've never received that love that's like no other and you want to receive it this morning so that you can then in turn live with intention and lead others to Him. I'm going to simply ask you to raise your hand on the count of three. If you want to receive that love that's like no other, one, two, three, Three, just raise your hand up to the Lord. If you're joining online, you just send us an email letting you know, letting us know that you want to receive that love. I'm going to pray with you right now. And if you're joining us here, you can, you can pray it too. Just, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I surrender myself afresh and anew to you. I repent of my sins. I receive you as King and Lord and Savior. Use me for your glory in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you, God, for this congregation, this army in front of me that you've anointed and appointed, that you created, designed, and chose this time for us to be alive, God. I thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. I thank you for what you're doing globally around the world, God. Lord, for this is the time, God, for your light to shine, God. No matter what is going on, no matter who's in what office, God, you are King of kings, you are Lord of lords, 
and you're calling your bride to arise, God. Lord, that this next chapter is going to be an awesome chapter for your kingdom, God. Lord, anoint and appoint us, God, to do your work, God. Let us live with intention, Lord Jesus. I pray for everyone here, God, that you would uh, just anoint them, God, to live and to shine, God, like, like they've never done before, God. Give us opportunities, God, like we spoke about, to be used for you, God. And let us hear those testimonies of you changing lives for your glory, God, that we can see you make all things new. We love you in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, the church said amen, amen, amen. Thank you for joining with us today. We love you so much. And won't you join us next door for those that are in the house, in our family room as we celebrate spring and one year in the family room. We love you guys. You've been to service. Now go be the church. Amen.